Don't have a plan B. Go all in. There's no other alternative. Please welcome Joel Kinnaman. I'm gonna be the president. You're gonna flip me those motherfucking controls. Slow to me! What have you done to me? There's your pep talk. Like most people in America, my introduction to you was in the killing. Yo, Beth. How's it hanging? And then now here you are, like the hardest working man in Hollywood, like you're all over the place. You have to fall in love with the craft. Finding acting gave me this whole purpose in life. And then I would start getting panic attacks. I would throw up every time before I went on stage. It's like these fucking demons that are in my head, like these voices that like cripple me, that ruin everything. Like what is the worst thing that they could experience? That's where everything changed. If you have that facility to not shy away from those things, then you're in this sort of curious growth mindset way of this approaching your life, right? a very good right? conversation. Uh, did I find my therapist? I'm extremely proud to introduce you to our newest brand partner, On. Check out their lineup of super comfortable, sleek, and durable pieces for yourself at on.com. So nice to meet you. Thanks for coming out here, nice dude. Nice to meet you too, yeah. Um, I remember, this must have been maybe three or four years ago. I saw a video of you like doing some cold plunging with Wim Hof. Oh yeah. And I think that was up at, was that up at Jeff Krasnow's place, Commune, up in Topanga Canyon? Oh, okay, well, yeah, because I did it a couple of times. We did it at my house once oh, was on it my you, rooftop, but then I think that you might've seen. Yeah, 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 because yeah. I was invited to that. I know Jeff and he was like, Wim's here, come on up, we're gonna hang out. And for some reason I couldn't go. And then I saw those videos, yeah. I think Lewis Howes was there. And I was like, damn man, because I, I was, really wanting to meet you and took a couple more years, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. but here we are. So um, cool. this is cool, dude. I know that you recently just got back from Jeddah, right? Yeah, just came back from Saudi Arabia. From the, the Red Sea Film Festival. Red Sea Film Festival, Out promoting yeah. the movie. I was promoting the movie. I was also in the jury for the film festival there. With Baz Luhrmann. Baz Luhrmann, yeah, epic, epic man. Yeah, and, uh, what's that guy film? like in real, in real life? Is he, he just seems like, such a genius artist, but also, uh, you know, that his presentation is almost a caricature of like <laughs> himself, you know? No, no, he's, he's like a living embodiment of I his know, movies. I know, no, but he's like, he's always on the move. He's always doing, you know, and like extremely fashionable, like, you know, like the latest fashion. He, he's, he's, a, he's a cool cat. Um, but I, I really enjoyed spending the time with him and, and the time that we got to spend in the jury there. Cause it was, we saw some incredible films. It was actually a, a really, really good experience being there. It was uh, like, it's a country where, you know, movies and music were illegal six years ago. Mm -hmm. Six years ago, women couldn't drive. And we were sitting in a movie theater, like an open theater with, you know, um, it was a hardcore, like Pakistani feminist movie with like a trans lead. And, and we were in the audience with maybe 30 women that were wearing like niqab, you know, where you only yeah. see the eyes. Mm -hmm. And people were like cheering at the end of the movie and you're just looking around and it was like- Times are hey, changing. This is, this is cool, yeah. Like a really, really special energy among like young people and, you know, women artists. Uh, yeah, it was, it, was, um, it was a pretty profound experience being there, I gotta say. I've been to Jeddah, I've been to a couple of places in Saudi Arabia and there's few places that you can travel to where you're like, wow, like I'm far from home. Like yeah. it is different here, you know? I mean, well, that was a number of years ago. It was probably like 2015, 16, something like that. I oh yeah, but exactly. I mean, that, then so it was, it you know, that was closed, yeah. closed Saudi Arabia, very mm -hmm. different place now. Yeah. And there's like a thriving, like growing film, like industry there. Because I know, weren't, aren't you, weren't you supposed to do this Neil Blomkamp movie? Yeah, at, exactly. Like Neo? Yeah, I was supposed to be shooting it right now, actually. Wow. So it got bumped. I mean, hopefully they'll put it together but uh, for, for next year, but we'll see. Yeah. The Neo thing is wild. The, I mean, the whole, their whole, like, their whole thing is pretty wild, you know? Also what they're doing, that they're putting so much into education. I mean, like kind of what sets them apart 
I mean, I don't want to sound like I'm a part of the Saudi yeah, you know, like tourism yeah, bureau, yeah, yeah, like exactly. you know, spawn con uh, here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and they have to pay me a lot more <laughs> for that. But um, no, but it's uh, you know, they have the population base to really have these to have a domestic industry that kind of clashes with the the outside uh, world that's coming in, and um, yeah, it's uh, it, it's it's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, so you're here mainly because Silent Night is out. Yeah. This movie is fucking unhinged, dude. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it must have been a trip uh, to shoot that movie. And I think it's, um, I mean, the movie's great. It like fires on all cylinders. It is, you know, just this sort of straight revenge, vigilante, you know, story yeah. about this guy with the special twist of there being like zero dialogue yeah. with the great John Woo who hasn't made a movie in the US in like 20 years, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, how did that come together? I mean, the invitation to like star in a movie by John Woo must've been a cool experience for you. Yeah, yeah, it definitely was. And then it being paired with, you know, sort of being, in some ways like a cinematic experiment, you know, that there's not a single line of dialogue in the movie. Um, so I, I wanted to, you know, take a, I, I, you know, I started out in, as a you know, theater actor and sort of in Swedish cinema and then I moved over here and, and over the course of my career here, I've done more and more action or you know mm -hmm. i've done some action and i enjoy that that part of it but i always want to find some action thing that is also paired with like real drama and and a, and a you know a real acting challenge so i don't feel like that part of it sort of stagnates and so this you know on its face really had both of those elements to get to work with one of the you know legendary directors of of film and then also having that element of there's no dialogue in it and you right. have to it's just a, a i mean it, it actually it, it it was one of those things that that really taught me to be you know taught me new things about my craft and, right and that's that's kind of hard to find when you've been doing it for as long as i have you would think that not having any dialogue that you would have to internalize and memorize would make it easier, but it's actually the opposite, right? Like you have to be super aware of all of your like sort of micro expressions and everything because yeah. you can't fall back or rely upon words to exactly. convey anything. But it's also, uh, you know, I, I realized that, you know, you, sometimes you use your voice to, to sort of get away with maybe not having quite the emotional charge that you need for a scene you know you know and, and it's like and you kind of bullshit your way through it and you see the the you see that expressed best in like american tv you know like shitty tv mm -hmm. uh, yeah i call it american whisper acting where it's like how could you do this to me man you know how yeah. could you and it's it's sort of like what actors do and you know i've been guilty of that as well where you sort of you put an effect in your voice to make it sound more emotional but you don't really have the emotional charge there. And when you tell the story with no dialogue and you have to do that, but it's just your eyes and your face, it just becomes flat if you don't have that. So I, I realized that the sort of the process of, you know, spinning up my emotion and, and the inner dialogue and the, the pace of my thoughts uh, had to be much, much more higher and intense where it had to be the sort of pure, uh, for the the expression in the face and the eyes to to come out and tell the story, because I I, I didn't have that crutch of a did you fake did you voice. recognize that in the process of doing it, or did you have that awareness like going in that you were going to have to deliver on that level in order to convey some level of authenticity? No, I think it was like day one where I was like, oh shit, yeah. <laughs> like <laughs> I really <laughs> got to work be, here. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm not I'm not going to get away with anything. But you went into it with a with a sort of plan to go full method on the whole thing, right? And not talk <laughs> at all, and that kind of fell apart. Yeah, you know, it it, it did fall apart pretty quickly. I um, yeah, it was a it was sort of a funny story with with me and my my fiance. I was like prepping her. I, I told the story on Fallon. I was like, I was I was prepping her. You know, like the, I'm, I'm I think I'm gonna go like full method on this. It's an opportunity to to really like go in deep and um, you know, because I've been. I play I play around with that kind of concentration, not not like the idea of method where you're 
were in character the whole time and you sort of forced the whole crew to call you like Mr. President. Like I, I'd never done that, but to sort of stay in the concentration of the character for the duration of the shoot. Um, and it's, it's more to just kind of spend time in the, you know, the physicality and the voice of the character. You get more practice of it. And I, I have done that sort of for, for, for mm -hmm. some projects and it has its pros and its cons. Um, so I was like, this. I think this one I'm gonna go like even deeper. I'm just gonna be, you know, silent for the whole shoot to just like really harness that energy. And and I was like, and that means that you know I'm gonna do it for the whole shoot. You know, so I'm not gonna be able to talk to you. We're we're not gonna talk on the phone. And she's like, what what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you're not gonna talk to me. Do you mean you're not gonna call me for two months? I'm like, yeah, I am an artist. Yeah, this is what I do. And uh, we had our talk with my uh, with our. Uh, a relationship uh, coach, Mark. Mm. Everyone needs a Mark. Yeah. Um, and so I, I had her all prepped up, and she was like, "Okay, like I, you know, I want to be there for you and and for your process, and you know, this is going to be really tough for our relationship, but let's do this." And um, and then, <laughs> like, I didn't even last. Like, I landed <laughs> in Mexico City and like called her before I went through immigration. <laughs> This will start when I get to set. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. And then, and then, yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah. So, but it's it, it's also like the 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 real of the story is I also very early realized that if I step back and and ha have like sort of a singular process where I'm only focused on my performance, uh, I was I. I was quickly convinced that the movie would suffer from that because like, especially when you have a role that where the narrative of the film is the character arc, you're so in, integral in the whole storytelling apparatus and there's so much that you can add and, and also, um, you know, film is a collaborative process. And, and if you have a singular process like that, you're going to cut out all the other artists that are on set uh, all the other artists that are behind the, the scenes that are also there and ready to sort of contribute with their art to make this collective art piece and and then you just make it about yourself and um, so it's it's a it's it's a it's a loss in that sense uh -huh. you know you lose a lot and and I realized that like no I need to really be a leader on on this set and well you're also, a producer on the movie also right yeah th that's not so important for this um but 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 yeah but but it's also you know the john is sort of he's like a quiet reserved you know like he, he he speaks with a very low voice and um so then there becomes other you know voices that are strong it can be like the first uh, the first assistant director that sort of runs the show and and overall the tone of the set can shift and and become something else and that tone can seep into the film as well so for me to like kind of step out of it then I, I can't add my. For me, it's really important, like to to create a good vibe on set yeah, yeah. and and to to have as many people sort of feeling creative as possible. Well, when you're the lead, you set the tone for everybody, right? And if you're brooding in the corner and not talking to anyone, like yeah. what does that do to the like you, you know the esprit de corps of everybody else? And then also, yeah. if you want to get feedback from Wu on your performance, you're gonna have to talk to the guy. <laughs> I know. Right? Like, it was the dumbest <laughs> idea to be quiet. I don't know why, like, uh, I, 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 <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm glad I, I came to my senses really quick. It would have been an absolute disaster. Um, there's a lot of like sort of shared DNA with this movie with like, you know, the Wick series. There's, and there, look, there's no, there's no Wick without Wu. Like John Wu, you know, sets yep. the stage and the template for everything that we love about John Wick. Yep. Um, but in that kind of shared sensibility, these fight sequences are are like really grounded in reality. You know, yeah. like they're not, you're not a superhero, you know, like you're actually fighting. The choreography feels realistic. It doesn't feel, it. you know, maybe it's heightened a little bit, but it doesn't feel like it's not something that wouldn't actually happen because yeah. you're not intended to be, you know, any kind of superhuman person. You're just yeah. an average dude doing it. Um, but the training had to be intense. I mean, you get this great montage and you get, you know, like the whole, <laughs> the whole, the whole ro Rocky thing. And like, you know, uh, I saw and you're a Team super America, fit guy, but. <laughs> but like, what was that like getting ready to like, you know, be able to 
show up with your shirt off like that. Yeah, no, the the, the key is you, you take all the steroids and, yeah, uh, and then you do three push ups every morning, yeah. you know, but really Lots strong. Lots of videos. <laughs> is Joel Natty or not? <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, every time yeah, there's no, something, guys, there's videos no. that are like, yeah. what's, what's the protocol? <laughs> yeah. What's the yeah. reality of like the Hollywood trainer culture? Yeah. I mean, um, you definitely, uh, uh, you know, vitamin T and then. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. You heard it here. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, I mean, I've sort of figured out how I how I like to train, and it, when, when you've done it a couple of times, it's sort of it, it kind of it's, it becomes kind of silly the whole sort of shirtless scene, you know. Mm-hmm. It, it, I, I feel silly, you know, Get putting the so arm much butter out. Now yeah, and all exactly. That. Um, but you know, for this, it was an important. Um, you know, it's important to show that, you know, the transformation sure. because he is this sort of, but in reality, you know, nobody would look like that, you know, from training in your garage, you know, that because that's yeah. mostly diet and, you know, vitamin T. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's, um, you know, when you've done it a few times, I know how to just, you know, kind of train and eat. Um, you look like that for like 24 hours. Exactly. Yeah, you can't no, like exactly. sustain that, that. that. That's what it is. Um, and, um, but then when it comes to all the stunt training and and that work, you know, it, that's sort of an accumulation of skills, I guess, because I've done a few action movies over the course of the years. And, and I ended up working with the same people a lot. Um, so, you know, because we've been working for several years, uh, for this one, and, and, and this was sort of when my producer side sort of came into it, I was able to, you know, bring this whole sort of stunt team into this and the, the, the fight team at least. And, um, and because, you know, the, the guy that I was playing wasn't any kind of specialist or martial artist or you know, didn't have any skills, the way that we wanted to make it exciting was to to make the fi- the fights like really frenetic mm-hmm. and uh, and messy and uh, so me and Jeremy Jeremy Marinas who was the fight coordinator on this who was also fight coordinator on on the Wick movies and he's gonna you know be a great action director in his own right um, we we had this idea that we were gonna we were gonna create the fights and we really didn't want it to look choreographed. Um, and um, and the way that we wanted to get away from that was to sort of to 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 create these sort of anchor points of of, uh, of choreography where you know like a couple of moves uh, you know that this gets slammed up against the wall, but then you know then he gets loose and and gets all the way over there, and then the way that we get there is sort of improvised and and it is fr- frenetic and. Um, and the hard thing that can be w- with doing that is that most stunt performers, they're trained to be very careful with the actor. And that's where it can look a little soft. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I, like Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is one of my like passions in life. Uh, so I would train a lot with the, with the guys I was uh, you know, working with and, and we would do some, some light Muay Thai sparring as well. So we became really comfortable with, you know, training with each other. So when it came to the more improvised parts of the fights, we were sort of comfortable with enough with each other to sort of turn up the intensity in those moments. And, you know, and, and you, have, you have these scenes where I was working with this guy, Vinny, we, we did this fight sequence with, in the, in the script, it's like the suited man. It's the guy that uh-huh. I take captor in, yeah. in, in, take captive in the beginning. And we, we have a, we had a, we had a really uh, cool fight scene in that, but, but, you know, it was one scene where he was like, you know, like pushing my face up, and and I and I looked at the the monitor. I was like, Vinny, look, like your 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 fingertips are not like they're they're sparing my face. Uh-huh. You know, it, you can see it. Like you gotta like you gotta dig. So it, it was a lot of me sort of pushing the stunt guys to like not go easy on me. Um, yeah. So but that, if you're uh, grappling with them, then they know where that edge is, how far they can push yeah, you. Yeah, because they know I what choked many unconscious or, uh, on, uh, <laughs> on occasion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and then on top of that, there's all the driving stuff. Like, so you're doing it. It looks like it's you in the car doing all that. And not all like, of it. I had uh, all the dr- all the the drifting and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. I I I, I was. Uh, they they taught me how to drift. Um, and uh, so I can do some shit, but. 
Uh, but then I had, uh, you know, Jeff, who was my my driving double, who's like a wizard on the wheel. He was doing, uh, you know, uh -huh. some of the wider shots and and. Uh, um, yeah, so it, 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 there's a combination, you know. There, there's there's a level uh, to what what I can do, but I, well, I was doing quite a bit. Like I, I, <laughs> I, I have some funny videos where, where uh, you know, because we, we were practicing for for a long time, uh -huh. and uh, so uh, yeah, we put John in the car <laughs> once while we were rehearsing, and uh, we thought it would be funny, and uh, and I drove John around and uh, just spinning and, out with him. So. <laughs> yeah, I did. I, I started <laughs> drifting a little bit, and he was like, "Okay, good." Mm, go back. <laughs> no. it, was, it was like that's oh, wild. I, not fun. <laughs> so, <laughs> you so, don't like that at all. Um, on the day to day, like jujitsu is your jam. Like, what's the what's the like wellness fitness routine just on a normal day when you're not prepping for a movie? What does that look like? Well, uh, for me, it, it depends. You know, there's sort of one routine that I have when it's just me living life. Um, and then it's one routine when I, I'm sort of gearing up for something. And usually it depends on how I want the character to look like. Um, uh, you know, for example, when I was sort of preparing for Sympathy for the Devil with, with Nick Cage, and then, and then right after that, I, I was preparing for the fourth season of For All Mankind. I was uh, for for fourth season of For All Mankind. I'm playing 72 years old, uh -huh. so I had this idea that I needed to lose a lot of weight. Um, so my goal was to lose 35 pounds. Um, it's just the the sort of the neck and the shoulders, you know, just that's what kind of goes on on older men. Yeah, and um, and I was gonna wear this uh, sort of like you know fake belly. On that one, but I just did. I wanted to get the the top part of my, you know, from my sort of the ribs and up, to just look skinnier. Um, so I wanted to lose weight for that, and then and then the character uh, in in Sympathy for the Devil, I was, uh, you know, Nick was sort of holding me hostage there, and uh, I, the skinnier, smaller I got, I, th I think the better it was for the dynamic. Um, you know, if you felt like that we were at least sort of similar size, it was because uh, I'm thinking I'm a little bit bigger than Nick. So, uh, you know, the the smaller I got, the better it would be for the dynamic of the film. So there I was on a mission to like lose weight. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm trying to do it, but still be able to train uh, just for my mental health. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so so then I'll just be training jiu-jitsu. Because uh, nothing makes me lose weight more than if I just train jiu -jitsu. If I just train jiu-jitsu and do nothing else, then I lose weight. Um, uh, so if, if I want to maintain weight, or, or get, then I got to lift weights and train jiu-jitsu. But you're not doing any crazy fasting? Yeah, no, I was. Yeah. Yeah, I was. Did you, you, so you were able to lose that much weight? 35 yeah. pounds? Yeah, I was, uh, I was fasting 18 to 20 hours. Wow. Yeah, mm. for almost eight months. <sighs> it was, yeah. Was, and then you go into For All Mankind and you're sitting in the makeup chair for hours making you look like an old man. Yeah, and, it, and, then, and then I felt like it, it didn't do as much as I wanted it to do. Um, so I sort all of, that effort? Yeah, it was like, I saw it, it, it did give a difference, but um, but yeah, it was, yeah, I was down to 166 and I'm usually like 195. Wow. and you're like 6'3", right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's pretty. So I'm lame. usually like between uh, between 195 and 200. That's uh -huh. sort of right. So. Um, I haven't seen the Nick Cage movie yet. I saw the trailer for yeah. it, and for some reason it escaped me. Like I'm like, when did this come out? Did it come out this summer? Yeah, it was. Uh, it was one of those unfortunate things that happened with the strike. So they'd set a release date, and we were supposed to do press. We had the press day set. And then, and then the strike got announced, and uh, we were we there was an opportunity to do the press right before the the strike kicked in, like literally like two hours before the mm. strike kicked in, and then Nick felt that it was not That's being not a good look, uh, solidar yeah, uh, you know, not showing solidarity to it. I was uh, very open to doing the, <laughs> the interview, so because uh, uh, <laughs> I, I mean the strike hadn't started yet, we had two hours. Like I'm very pragmatic with those kind of things. Um, but um, yeah, so so we 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 didn't 
we did no press for it. Yeah, I heard and, nothing uh, about it. And then uh, and it kind of just got released into the void. I'm gonna watch it now though, because yeah. it looks it looks pretty. It's wild. cool. Like it's a yeah. tiny movie, uh, but it's basically me and Cage in a car. Uh -huh. You know, I got I had to get to experience a lot of Cage rage. You know, directly at my face. Which, I can't uh, decide whether that guy is a lunatic or a genius or both, but um, both. there's a pretty strong argument that he's the greatest living movie star that we have. I mean, uh, that yeah. guy is like unique in it's every incredible. way. Like, what is he like? What is that like working with him in person? Uh, it's like just as advertised, you know, like the first day that we rehearse, you know, I, I we go to his house, me and Yuval, the director, and knock on his door. This is a house in Vegas. And he opens up. Is that where like, he lives? He lives in Vegas? In Vegas, yeah. Vegas. And, and he opens the door and he's like, hi. And I'm like, hey. And he's got pink hair. And, and then he's like, fuck. I'm like, what? <laughs> it's like, my cat. My cat ran away. It's my wild cat. It's the third time he does it. And I'm like, oh, oh okay. And he's like, come in. And then, and then we walk in and, and his house is like, a, uh, it's a little gothic. And in and, and the living room, he's got his big bird cage. And uh, and he's like, hey, here's Hoagie, 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 and he starts yelling at his bird. I'm like, shit, this is so good. And he's like, that's Miles. He's my reptile manager. I'm like, okay, okay, what's up, Miles? And then we go down in the basement and then we start rehearsing. And on the first day of rehearsal, uh, he's completely off book on the entire script. He's on his feet, uh, rehearsing like full patty, and. Uh, you know, it's we're, it's we're like ten days away from shooting a movie, and he's he has the whole script memorized, and just really has a has a very clear idea of what he's doing with this character, and it's like a wild, you know, it's a it's a wild take on the character, uh -huh. and um, and it's a, uh, I got to, <laughs> I I got to give him an award, and when I was in Saudi, they they gave him some sort of appreciation award. And, uh, and I had this sort of speech written that I handed in to the producers where I was talking about his acting balls. But uh, apparently they, they didn't want that on Saudi TV, so I had to cut, the, <laughs> had to cut that line. But I was like, I was talking, we talk about acting balls and, and Nick's acting balls are like fucking watermelons. Because it's like, you know, he never plays it safe, you know? He, yeah, and, 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 he and, goes for it every time and it doesn't matter what movie it is, he's yeah. like, Balls to the wall, yeah, hundred percent. And it's uh, like the kind of like he always has such a fascinating, <laughs> like he, his his choices are always so extreme, you know. And it and it you know, it's risky. It means you can miss, of course. You know, th there's a bigger likelihood that you can miss, but also that's when you that's how you create the most memorable characters that have ever been made and and you know where it's pure genius and i like i that's not my approach i i'm i try to find a more you know subtle way to to tell the, I, I tried to sort of meld the character with some something of my own you know i create a new body language and way of talking and stuff like that but um but it's a sort of a more s subtle way i i tried to you know, find the, the the most subtle way to tell the story, and he's not interested in naturalism, and and he uh -huh. says that. So I was I was so fascinated to work with him. I was actually chasing a project to to do with him because I I really wanted the experience to to see how he works and like just as advertised and uh, yeah. And but uh, he has his own internal logic for all for all of those choices. Like when yeah. pressed or asked, he can tell you exactly why he's doing what he's doing. Yeah. As extreme as it may be, <laughs> yeah. um, but I'm just envisioning you, like you know, in the car with him or whatever take, and he's throwing something insane at you, and yeah. you've got to figure out how to, you know, not react, laugh. yeah, yeah. <laughs> in real like, in real time to the, some unexpected he thing. He did that's so like many crazy script. things. Yeah. He did so many crazy things while we were shooting that movie. It was. <laughs> He had these like improvisations that was like, officer. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> now did, I have to watch it. Is so, it streaming? Where can you see this? Yeah, I think I think it's on Hulu. Uh, I, think, uh -huh. I think it might be on Hulu. He is the best. Uh, I love Nick so much, and and I'm so happy that like he exists, and and that I mean, I was pinching myself. <laughs> many times but he he made it like impossible to 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 act sometimes you know because he would just go into these like 
it's really absurd improvisations of uh, him like you know yeah it's uh, it was, he was like jerking off his like massive uh, imaginary dick while the police had just pulled him out he was like officer <laughs> officer he was like doing these <laughs> oh my god this is this is impossible to have in a movie <laughs> and uh, and i think he was a lot of the things he was doing kind of to entertain himself as well but yeah he's uh he's a genius yeah Every athlete I know is gonna tell you that having the right gear is key to performance. If what you're wearing is poorly crafted, it's just gonna put distance between you and those goals you've set. You owe it to yourself to invest in the best, and the best is on. I'm obsessed with the Cloud Ultra, great on the trails, and I just got the new next-gen Cloud Stratus 3 for the road, I'm loving those. But On also has this incredible line of lightweight, high-performance apparel that is just beyond anything I've previously donned. It's like this second-to-none second skin. I love to rock the sweat-wicking Ultra T and the Ultra Shorts, which have this pocket right at the base of the spine that perfectly anchors your phone. No jiggle. I'm just so proud to partner with On, and I love their vision for the future where their gear is fossil-free and engineered for circularity. So check out their amazing lineup of super comfortable, sleek and durable pieces for yourself at on.com. Speaking of, you know, making more nuanced choices or kind of being intentional about how you inhabit a role. I mean, I think like most people in America, my introduction to you was in The Killing. Mm -hmm. um, that was your first truly American kind of introduction. No, that was uh, my first job in the US. It wasn't. No, it, it was. was. Yeah. yeah, that's what I yeah. thought, right? Yeah. That's what brought you here from Sweden. No, I had already come here. I, I came here to sort of to try it out. And then I was, uh, uh, you know, doing auditions and. So you'd like, you were already living here when you got yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you had done on. that. Um, what was the other movie that you did that kind of came out right around the same time? The Weinstein Company movie? Where you want, there was a Swedish movie. Uh -huh, you got yeah, like a yeah. best actor. Uh, yeah, it. it uh, Snabba Cash, e Easy Money. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, that was yeah, a Swedish yeah. movie. Yeah, yeah. No, so I had a, I was working in Sweden, and and then and then I moved to the states. Right. And uh, and then I was doing auditions, and you did a, a shitload of stuff in Sweden before you before the killing. I mean, your IMDb yeah. is like ten miles long of all the <laughs> Swedish stuff that you did yeah. before you came here. I had a intense um, <laughs> intense uh, career in Sweden. Um, I finished acting school in 2007 and, and I was on stage for a couple of years in the, on the National Theater. And then at the same time I did, uh, I did nine features in 16 months. Wow. Um, and I played the lead in, in six of them. <laughs> so, so it was like a, a very intense, and then, and then I moved to, to the States. Mm -hmm. And The Killing was sort of the first it's sort of the introduction to an American audience of like this Scandi noir like genre that yeah. now we can all enjoy on Netflix. Like right. I just I love watching all the you know all these like crime noirs that are yeah. all all from that part of the world. Um, so dark and you know not yeah. interested in happy endings and <laughs> not at all. Yeah, and and the killing you know is definitely that. But your character was almost. Uh, on some level, like comedic relief, like the choices that you were making about that guy, it was it, it was really riveting. Like you made an indelible impression. You're like, who is that dude? You know. <laughs> and then now here you are, like the hardest working man in Hollywood. Yeah. Like you're all over the place. But that must have been the reception to that must have been pretty cool at the time because that show was a big deal when it aired. Yeah, but it was a it was a weird show because it was. Um you know, it's, it's such a long time ago now. Um, and the sort of TV space was so different then. It was like right in the beginning still of the sort of golden era yeah. of TV where audiences were audiences were still sort of steeped in an older, uh, older tradition and had expectations that were different because like the, the first season, the, 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 the season finale of the first season of uh, of that show uh, created an outrage and people were furious i don't remember that and abandoned the show because 
it was a whole season where, you know, you're going to, they were sort of, they felt that they were promised that they were going to find out who the killer was in the end of the first season. And then they didn't, you didn't, didn't find out. on that. And, um, and people were furious and, and, and like abandoned the show. And it was like, uh, and, and then the second season, uh, was you know in the first season we were sort of like Mireille got nominated and it there was sort of like good and then the second season it was like just abandoned by critics and um and and then it and then it got canceled after two seasons um and then and then the third season got picked up again and it was actually Netflix second show that they produced mm -hmm. it was a co-production with Netflix they would only done House of Cards right and then they co-produced the third season of uh uh, of the killing together with AMC, and then it got canceled again. AMC canceled it, and then Netflix ended up picking up like an abbreviated uh, fourth season of it. So it was a show that sort of really found a, an intense audience, um, but it was canceled twice. Right, and then and then sort of after the fact on streaming, it really, um, it 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 you know, I I still like. People that sort of know me from that show, they always they're always friendlier to me than than people that know me from other things. There's something with that <laughs> Why, character. Because, that, because it, well, there was something very endearing about him, as fucked up as he was. Yeah, you know, like you you were he was a, he seemed like a good hang, even yeah. though he was like chaotic and unstable. <laughs> yeah, and like you know, in his I own love playing weird, that character. fucked up way. Yeah, I, I love playing Holder. And that was sort of an interesting transition because that's a remake of a Swedish show. A, a Danish yeah. show, Danish show. Oh, it's Danish. Yeah, we for, used to, we owned Bridleson. them for a while, so it's okay, but oh. uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, but I assume that that then led to, you know, all of these opportunities, like getting noticed in that um, opened up the door for you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was uh, pretty arrogant and uh, full of myself there for a while. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I... Uh, Cause I, uh, there was a while when I was like, just like, just fucking cancel the show already. I want to go make big movies and uh, be a movie star. I don't have time for this shit anymore. And then, <laughs> and then, and then, but I was glad that I, at least while I was shooting the show, I, I kind of, when it came back, I, I, I did really appreciate um, that it, it was something special. And, and also like me and Murray, uh we got along so well and i mean we're we're close friends to this day and um and then what, what was really special with that show too was i mean we had so many great directors there's so many like feature film directors uh -huh. that came in and did episodes but jonathan demi um the 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 you know did silence of the sure. lamb and uh, the legend he uh, he fell in love with the show and then you know called Vina and asked if he could come direct. And then he directed uh, an episode in, in the third season. And then he ended up uh, directing the series finale. Oh, wow. And, uh, and yeah, and he was just a, he was one of those sort of um, a, a bright genius. Like he was, he was, uh, he had, he, he was a, like a friendly, a friendly genius. You know, mm -hmm. he, he was every, he was like a son, you know, that like when, when he looked at people, they just kind of like warmed up and, and like blossomed, you know, he, he just had this, in, he engaged everyone. Everyone just, uh, he was a beautiful man. Yeah, yeah. He died way um, too soon. Legend. Obviously when you're early in your career, you're auditioning, you just want to get jobs or whatever. But now in the position that you're in now, what is the process? Like, how do you, how do you choose what to get involved with? Like what are the variables or the parameters that are most important to you when you're looking at a project to decide like, is this something I wanna be in or invest in? Yeah, I mean, uh, the the most important thing, I mean, the two most important things are the, the director and the character. Um, I think before I would actually put the director further down and I would put the character first. Um, now though they're sort of equal, and I, and I realize that I, th I think it's also it's a different um, it's a different thinking when you're coming up and uh, and when you're trying to make a make a name for yourself mm -hmm. than when you're sort of at a level and you want to make great things because like coming up it can even be good to to you know have a great role in a sort of semi shitty project because you you have a chance to shine right you know um, and you can like. If if you're great and everyone else is mediocre, or, or then um, 
you know, it, you'll get noticed. So I think that's sort of how I looked at things when I was coming up. I was, I was like, like if I if I saw a role, like I know I can make something out of that, and and it doesn't matter who the director is, like as long as they stay out of my way. Um, but then, but then now it's like, it doesn't matter if you're gonna do a great performance in something that is a piece of shit, right? Because right? nobody's gonna see it. And uh, so, uh, so now I'm, for me, it's uh, it's like director character story um i mean they're all really and and it, it kind of has to check all the boxes um and then i think you know money is number four yeah of course i mean but the thing is like you're in an industry where there isn't a ton of agency over what you get to do but now that you're like this leading man and you're in all these movies and you've established that you can you know do the thing and um, you're bankable in that regard. When you look at the careers of of so many actors, you know, maybe great and not so great, their legacy or how we perceive them or how we think of them as artists and what their careers mean boils down to the choices that they've made. Yeah. And some are really good at choosing the right projects. And then they have this extraordinary legacy and this this like catalog of amazing work and others who are perhaps equally as talented or as bankable, for some reason, their picker isn't as good or who knows what's going on, or maybe it's just luck. And, you know, look, nobody goes into a movie um, thinking, you know, trying to make a bad movie. Like it's almost a miracle when when a movie gets made, let alone is good. <laughs> yeah. um, but at this, and, and there's only so much control you have over that, but you see these people and you're like, oh, if they just, done this or this, or they hadn't done that or whatever. And then suddenly they're out of the game and their career is on a very different arc or trajectory. So those choices that you make become like really mission critical in terms of, of how you think about your career and the longevity of what you wanna do and what you wanna stand for as an artist. Yeah, no, you 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 nailed it. It's, um, <clears throat> yeah, especially, it's exactly that when you get to that position where you uh, have built up an audience and and people are sort of you know you want to create a feeling that oh we can go see you know a Joel Kinnaman movie and uh, and and it's going to have a certain amount of quality like it might not it might not always be uh, like a hit but there's going to be a certain level like there's uh, an, a certain kind of taste that that is um that, that you know that you can deliver in, on in some way and it comes down to taste and how you pick but then you know there's a lot of variables uh, yeah. of course so you can't control it all and uh and at my level i i i can't control it all but but uh yeah it's uh and you know you, you also i work with people as well and and i get their input and you know of course the decision comes down it's i make the decision of course but i'm very happy with like my manager and my agents and um so you know we discuss these things and and you, you try to uh you know limit the 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 probability of uh, of it not being good you know yeah um but then for me it's also really important that the character scares me a little bit you know it's uh because i'm also al always focusing on avoiding stagnation you know both as a person and as an artist and uh, so it you know that's why I really tried to stay away from you know playing the same kind of character mm -hmm. over and over again, and it, and it's sort of the the artistic tradition that I come from in Europe, where the highest is always to as an actor to you know do the most different kind of characters. You know that's why Nick Cage is like the 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 most incredible expression of that. Um, but um, but but that is, that is sort of in me the whole time i'm trying to stay like you know 10 percent outside of my comfort zone and everything that i do who's the director that you most want to work with who are the who are who's like at the top of the list of the people like if you had your druthers um you know of course tarantino you know mm -hmm. it, it's uh he's is you know been behind so many iconic uh, characters. See the Safty brothers. Yeah. Um, are they are they still going to be directing together? I think they're kind of doing their own separate things right now. Okay. So probably 
They're exciting filmmakers, though. Yeah, re sure. really, yeah. really exciting. Um, and you see the kind of performance that they get from their actors, and they choose, you know, act. You know, they get what's what's so fascinating with them, and and you see that they they Im help the actor immerse themselves into the world that they are portraying. So, you know, they get someone like Rob Pattinson or... Oh, uh, yeah. What they uh, got out of him in good time is insane. That movie is unreal. You know? Yeah. I mean, Rob is, you know, becoming one of the, the you know, he's one of the greatest of, of our generation for sure, you know? And, and he makes really interesting choices that he really are counterintuitive. I've, I've always like really commended him, you know, because he got super famous with and, and was like really, you know, hounded paparazzi famous after the the whole uh, the, his vampire movies yeah. and because he also got you know mixed into you know tabloid city with with, uh, with the the girlfriend that he had at the time so he 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 had that like really high level of fame so you know they the studios were throwing every spandex suit they could find on him and he just would not put them on you know he he, he didn't do any you know superhero stuff or any any anything that would you know that other actors would like kind of jump on because you know it's a mm -hmm. it's a, kind of a straight ticket to a list level where you can really be bankable for for bigger projects, and um, and he just he instead went off and did a bunch of strange movies with really interesting yeah. directors. So he basically went to film school, yeah, yeah. And, and you know Cronenberg and you know all all these films that he did, and he, he went to film school and, and and started working with really interesting artists, and then became a very interesting artist yeah. himself. So you know, and then I, put on the Batman suit, and then he comes back the and does Batman. <laughs> I mean, that's like that's how you do it. He yeah. won, like Rob yeah. won. <laughs> I know it's pretty funny. Yeah. Uh, speaking of great directors, I watched. Um, Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, like two weeks ago, I was like revisiting all these Fincher movies, getting ready to watch The Killer. And hilariously, like you're, you're like a staffer at Millennium Magazine in that movie, like in the background, you have like no lines. I know. Do you have a single line in that movie? Uh, I think I whisper something. Was that before The Killing? No, it was during. So did the, you have? Did you get edited out? Did you have lines that got edited out of that no, or whatever? No, 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 no. I was I was cast for the second and third movie. Um, yeah. So that character became a bigger character in the second and third movies, um, but then they never ended up uh, happening. Yeah. And then and then Fincher decided that he wanted to introduce the character in that in those scenes. Just you know, just wanted to right. place him. There. You're just kind of around. <laughs> I know it's pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> Coming from Sweden and living here, uh, what are the kind of cultural differences between the Swedish perspective on I don't know life and lifestyle? versus United States. Like one of the things, like we opened this with talking about Wim Hof a little bit, like it's all about cold plunging and sauna here. And it's yeah. like, well, this goes back thousands of years and sweet. It must <laughs> yeah. be hilarious to you that everyone's <laughs> like losing their minds over this. Yeah, I mean, it's great, you know, it, it's also now when there's so much literature around it and, and people understand how good it is for your health, you know, and I, in, in both in Sweden and Finland, you know, I, the Swedish and Finnish uh, traditions of also drinking vodka in the sauna. You know, mm. I don't know if that is a real like longevity measure. Yeah. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, I mean, I think we have a more sort of stoic um, approach to life, and and I think uh, you know it's really like an East and West thing where um, where I think Sweden is also you know pretty far east, and and when. When someone asks you, you know, like, how you doing? And uh, then, you know, it's a very reasonable thing to say, like, bad, you know, mm -hmm. not good today, you know, just heavy, you know, just, I just feel like I have a heavy day, you know, just woke up feeling really melancholy. And then that's that, okay. And then, and, then, and that can be a conversation yeah. where, so that was like an issue for me when I moved here and I was sort of, um, going to the meetings with Hollywood producers and casting agents and in, you know, like bright California. Uh -huh. And, and and you know, you, you sit down in these meetings and to get to know each other and sort of 
you're intended to like show your personality and my my approach to that was like i'm gonna like be who i am you know that's that's uh, that's the personality that i have so that's the only one i'm gonna show and um so when i woke up feeling melancholy on a day and i would go into one of these meetings with you know these like bright faced uh casting agents and they were like hi how, how, how you feeling today how are you doing and i would be like it's, it's okay you know i just kind of woke up and, and i you know i just feel pretty heavy today i just felt like you know you know i don't know what i'm doing here you know what what's what what is this all about and then i'd just be quiet <laughs> <laughs> and, and you just yeah. see that their faces just yeah. fell, you know, and, and I'm like, you know, it's okay. I'm fine. You know, I'm not going to kill myself, but I'm just, you know, just heavy today. How you doing? And then, uh -huh. and, then be, and, and then I learned later, like, you know, I, I get the feedback, like, uh, is, is he okay? Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and my, my manager would be like, you know, you might want to like brighten it up a little bit. And uh, so I, I learned, I learned that the, the hard way that when they ask, you know how you doing? It's not, it's not a real question. It's uh -huh. like <laughs> there's a is there a bit? Is this true or false? Like there's a bit of a tall poppy syndrome thing in in Sweden, right? Like oh yeah yeah yeah, we call it the the law of Yanta, the Yanta law. Yanta. Yeah, I don't know what it's why it's called that. It's just the name. So how does that work with you saying I'm going to go to America and be a movie star with your buddies back home? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so I think my personality is probably like pretty un-Swedish, um, and uh, and I think I my I I really looked up to the sort of American spirit and uh, of uh, you know, and I and I loved how people here kind of celebrate others other people's success. You know, it it's a uh, um, is much less of a sort of like jealous snipiness of like cutting someone down that's trying something different and so i i sort of acknowledged and saw that existing here and and, mm -hmm. I, and i love that i thought that this is so much more positive it, I, for me the, the whole thing of like feeling shitty or being disappointed in someone else's success was always like such a sign of weakness to me it was like i i, I don't understand like i don't i'm not like my house isn't getting you know smaller because his house is getting bigger you know it's uh uh so to not be inspired by other people's success mm -hmm. and, and feeling like shitty and, and then talking shit about it is like such a uh i thought it was such a sign of weakness and and uh and sort of that you didn't have the the insight that you were kind of embarrassing yourself while in behaving that way um so I think I had that analysis down pretty quickly uh, in, in in Sweden, and and I and I remember like in my group of friends, uh, it was it was a lot of competition, and uh, and and I I had a whole group of friends where I felt that you know they weren't on my team, you know they weren't celebrating my success, um, and and I I was celebrating their, theirs, and. Uh, mm -hmm. And I wasn't threatened by them doing well, um, but uh, but it wasn't the other way around. So it it came to a point where I actually had a like I broke up with a whole um, my whole like older group of friends in Sweden, and and just like focused on like three or four of those friends. You had done a lot of work in Sweden as a young person. I'm sure you know, in that country, people knew who you were. Um, and then at some point you like took a break, right? And just traveled, like, I don't know if you quit acting, but you're like, I'm done for a while. And you went and did a whole bunch of different things and had weird jobs and stuff like that. Was that like an intentional way of like, just getting perspective on on what you wanted to do and who who you wanted to be or what was that all about? That, that was actually before I, I started acting. Oh, it was? Yeah. So, so it was, I finished, uh, you know, high school or, or the equivalent in Sweden. And, uh, and then I went to, to Norway and uh, just had a bunch of odd jobs to save money to go travel. And, and I, it, I hadn't made up my mind of what I wanted to do. So I had this idea that I was gonna, I was gonna work and travel for seven years before I made up my mind of what I wanna do with my life. That's that was a sort of, one, seven years. Seven years. That's, Why seven? I mean, I it must know. be like I'll take a year or something. Yeah. No, I don't know. It was uh, that that that's just something I had in my mind. Like my my whole family is sort of travelers. Um, 
uh, everyone's like been sort of a backpacker. My my, my dad is is a crazy story, but um, but even my mom and all my sisters, we've all been, you know, going traveling around the world, and, and that's been a, a you know big part of our family culture. Um, so so it was just something I wanted to see the world, and and I, I had no idea what what I wanted to do with my life, and uh, wasn't very confident in anything. I wasn't particularly good in anything. I didn't have any sort of a- academic. A prospect like because uh, I, I I kind of fucked up school, so so it it was just uh, I, I just want, I was just gonna make money. Uh, I was pretty good at like hustling, making money, and uh, and then I was gonna go travel. That was sort uh-huh. of my idea. And how did the acting thing come about then? So I'd actually done a TV series when I was ten years old. So I had like a childhood acting experience. And my oldest sister, she was an actor, so mm-hmm. she sort of introduced that it was a profession. And um, and then I got this opportunity to do this like TV series in Sweden, so I had I'd had a childhood experience of it when I was ten, and then sort of forgot about that, and and then some of my friends uh, were actors. They were like they were going to acting school. There was a couple of them, so I was I had this I had this like childhood experience of it, and and then you know I had these friends that were doing it, and then. After like a year and a half of traveling, I just had this idea like, you know, maybe I'll try that, you know, mm-hmm. maybe I'll try that. And then I started working with my friend, uh, Gustav Skarsgård, who's uh, uh, Alex Skarsgård's younger brother and Stella Skarsgård's yeah. son as well. Um, and I started working with him and uh, and he was kind of shaking his head, but... Uh, <laughs> But I, I didn't give up, and, and he gave me enough uh, confidence to kind of continue. And then I decided that I was gonna uh, try out for the National Theater School. And uh, and I worked with this actor, with an older actor. I, I got a hold of an older actor that agreed to like work with me. And and I was working on this, uh, this monologue from Long Day's Journey Into Night by Eugene O'Neill. And it was this text where like Edmund just finally like goes against his dad and just lets him hear every every like you know all of his uh, he, he lets out all of his frustration and anger and sadness uh, at his dad's you know failures and and him not being there or not caring and uh and I'd had my own issues with my dad and uh, and it was like the and it was in one of the rehearsals when I was was working with this text, and then something just clicked in, and the text just like kind of came alive, and it just took over, and I got like filled with emotion, and the words just came flying out in a, in a way that I wasn't really planning them, and um, and I understood later like this was the first time mm-hmm. I had gotten flow, um, and uh, and you know after the. The scene was done. I was kind of like panting and just quiet, and 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 I, you know, of course, I understood in some way that like this is probably not bad. And um, and then that actor, Thomas, he was like, "Okay, listen, you can you can do this as a profession, mm. um, but you know, it's gonna be a lot of work. But but you 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 can do this as a profession. Yeah, you got locked in. Yeah, yeah, that's got to be an intoxicating feeling, though, to know that you can connect with the material in that way and channel something from a flow state based on your experience and some yeah. facility for inhabiting a character. Yeah, that was a high, yeah. you know, it was a real natural high. And uh, yeah, and then I got really addicted to that mm. feeling and like was chasing that. And um, and then I just became obsessed. And, and it was also, I hadn't really experienced being good at anything before. Like I've been okay, you know, but I was okay at sports, um, but I was never like great at anything. Um, so it was the first time where I like there was something that just kind of caught me in, and I felt like I could maybe be good at something, and and that just changed my whole outlook and view on the possibility of my life, and um, yeah, I, I like started looking at myself with a different 
like level of potential and respect in a way. And uh, and then I just and then that feeling just it just started like vibrating, and then and it just made me be become completely obsessed, and I did nothing but it, uh, but but focusing on acting and and trying to get as good as possible. And that's super interesting. I, I you know to, to have like a peak experience like that, but also to have the self awareness, the presence of mind to like recognize that that was a special moment and could perhaps lead your entire life in a different direction. Yeah. And it makes me wonder, like you can't, you can't have those experiences unless you're putting yourself out there and trying lots of things. So many people go through life and maybe they never have an experience like that because they yeah. keep their lives sort of contained in a certain way. Um, but then of the people that are lucky enough to you know, trip upon their version of that type of experience, what is the quality within an individual to like help them lock onto that and realize like the gravity of it or the importance or mm -hmm. like the potential, it's like potential energy, right? Yeah. Like, oh, here's something, if I nurture this, maybe I can have a different kind of life. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know, uh, I think it's, uh, it's gonna, it's gonna, it's, it has to be so individual, right? It, it's like it has to sort of collide with your history and your right. life, and and then the more I started working, and, and then you know deeper in, I I started seeing that sort of my life experience and and the different experiences that I've had, and and in many ways like all the the problems that I'd had, and. Uh, and all the trauma, all the trauma that I had experienced in my life, all of a sudden weren't like something that was dragging me down, but it was actually like my greatest asset. Yeah, it was. It's like fertile soil. Yeah, yeah. and and I was like, fuck, I I have all these pieces and all these experiences that I can like put into characters that I don't think that most people can, and so it, it um, yeah. And then you just have a bunch of SARS guards around you. Yeah, right? yeah, Because yeah. <laughs> everybody in Sweden knows everyone, right? Yeah. Yeah, and there's the, one the, high school. The crazy thing yeah. is me, um, Gustav Skarsgård, I think built Skarsgård too. Numi Rapaz, who plays a girl with yeah. the dragon tattoo. Uh, we all went to the same high school. What, and Alexander also? Uh, I th Alex lived right next door to that that high school uh -huh. uh, because that's where the Scars Guards lived. But uh, but I think he went to another school actually. That's a pretty uh, high hit rate, you know, like yeah. per capita. Yeah, crazy. There needs to be like a plaque or something like yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> Have you gone back to to your high school or or like revisited you know that that you know place to kind of marinate and? No, I actually yeah. didn't really fully graduate. <laughs> <laughs> They'll give you an honorary degree yeah, though. You yeah. can go back there at yeah. some point. They, they, it's called like, uh, in Swedish it's called Samlat Betygs Dokument. It's like, a, uh, it's like a, a, a collection of your grades, but it's not like a diploma because uh -huh. I actually didn't get enough points. To right. <laughs> <laughs>
Is that the sort it's of like Iron North Man? To South. Iron Man ish. It's like its own thing it. that started yeah. there, and now there's a series of these races mm. all over the world. Are, do, have you done the Iron Man? Are you in that sort I of? I did. Yeah, I do a bunch of endurance stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I did. I think it was 2017 that I did that race. Okay. Yeah. So it was pretty cool. So I got to see up close and personal what those islands are like. It's, what, it's what, so what's, beautiful. What's the most uh, challenging thing that you've done? That was the hardest one day thing that I've mm. ever done. How um, many hours does it, does it take? Oh, I think it was like nine or 10 hours oh, or something crazy. like that. But the guys that, that are, re- so first of all, on that day, it was like the world's worst weather. There was like sideways rain. Yeah, and we, like we, we got a lot of that. <laughs> four to six foot like chop. It was banana, like all day. It was like the most miserable yeah. experience ever. And then you're freezing in the water and then you're running across these islands and you're in like a wetsuit. So you start to get overheated. Mm. And just when you start to warm up, then you're back in the water. You're like uncomfortable the entire time. Oh, wow. um, so that, yeah, as a one day thing, that was probably the hardest, but I've done, I've done this race called Ultraman. It's a three day double Ironman around the big island of Hawaii. And I've done that a bunch of times. Oh, Jesus. I've done well in that race. And then I did five Ironmans. So an, on five an Ironman wasn't islands. enough. You... I never did just an Ironman. I went to the longer stuff. <laughs> It's a whole other thing, but this is not about me. This is about you. But so my wh- point being, yeah, but I'm curious. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> my point being, uh, I I know those. I know the archipelago uh, better than most. And what's interesting about that race is, when the gun goes off, like I'm a good swimmer, so I was like near. You know, I was in good position. The you, you, the first swim is like a kilometer crossing, and then you get to this island on the other side. And I've been training around here in the mountains and mm-hmm. desert and whatever going to the pool and then doing trail running. And I thought that would be good. And and these like Swedish special forces guys who train year round on this course to win this race, climb out of the water and they're dancing on these rocks like ballet dancers. And I'm we're, everybody's falling and some guy cracked his head open immediately. You know, it's not like, it's like an obstacle course as yeah. much as anything else. Yeah. Yeah, it was wild. Wow. So maybe we ran across your island. I don't know <laughs> yeah, or yeah. your compound there. <laughs> yeah. um, but you know, midsummer, like that time of year in that part of the world, is just the greatest thing. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty epic. We have, uh, like, on our property, we have this. Uh, we have a sauna that's it's legally a boat, so it's like on a raft. Uh-huh. It, it was it, it, initially it, it was to to get away from having to apply for building permits. Cause it's hard to get building permits close to the the coast. Um, it's and all the all the dwellings on all those islands look like it. It it definitely looks like it's controlled. Like you can't just build whatever you want. Yeah, the, and it, it's it's very it's very much about how it blends into mm. the nature and like we have all of our houses. When when you uh, it's like it's like six houses now on the property, but when you come from the ocean, you almost can't see them because they're all like. They're all colored like the wood. It's like it's wood colored and with like blue, so it kind of blends into the sky. Uh-huh. And that's very much a sort of Swedish aesthetic to like you 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 sort of ra- nature is the highest, and and you want to leave as little of a footprint as possible. So that's also the laws. Like you can't have too much glass because that it creates glare. And um, wow, yeah, um, it's often said that the Scandinavian countries have like the highest happy quotient, like people are just happier there than they are in other parts of the world, despite the fact that the winter is like endless and it's, you know, dark most of the time. (laughs) Like when you reflect upon your upbringing there, your Swedish heritage, like what, what, why do you think that is? What is the, what is the sensibility of those cultures that lead to a greater degree of happiness than we experience here? I don't know. I mean, I don't know how much you can actually like if if those are true. Those like sort of how people. I mean, I mean if you I, watch Scandi Noir, it doesn't look like everyone's it doesn't very look happy. Like it, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, I th- I think that there you know there is a general sense uh, of you know I think more people in general are sort of in contact with nature and in nature spend time in nature. Um, I think we have things like. You know, we sauna, uh, get in the ocean even when it's colder. Um, I think those things are, are probably very good. Um, but I mean, I know a lot of 
depressed Swedes too. Yeah. And I think the suicide rate is pretty high mm. as well. So, um, and and the level of like alcoholism, especially in the north, sure. is, is is pretty high as well. But um, the Danes seem to be happier than than the Swedes. Yeah. Uh, Finland. Yeah, and the the Finns are definitely not happy. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> they're definitely not happy. Um, I mean, they're almost Russian. You know, it's uh, the, the Finns are their own thing. It, the, the, they're, uh, um, I don't know. I, I think uh, I think that there there is sort of a some level of stoicism in in society that. Um, you sort of like accept the way things are, and and uh, I, th I think that's. I think people don't have too much expectation either. You mm -hmm. know, I think. Uh, um, I think Swedes are pretty good at managing their expectations, so so they won't get that disappointed. There's also a safety net. Everyone kind of knows they can only fall so far before yeah, they'll be sure. caught. And my sense is just that everybody's out moving all the time. Yeah. It doesn't matter how dark or cold it is. Yeah. Like they're 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 skating on the frozen waters or they're cross country skiing or they're swimming yeah. or they're, you know, jumping in freezing water and like in a way that isn't is does feel different than here. Yeah, no, for sure. I, I, and that's sort of what I was, was getting to with like people being in nature. People, I think, exercise much more in general. The level of obesity is uh, uh, is very different than here. And um, they feel like they're working to live more than we 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 sort of live to work here. Yeah, it's uh, the the general work week is you know forty hours. Uh, so I think that's probably a lot less than. Uh, than here, yeah, and uh, and then we have a lot. Uh, the normal Swede has six weeks vacation, six to eight weeks a year. Yeah, so so th there's there's definitely that. Um, when you look back on your career, I mean, you came here to you know plant your flag in Hollywood, and you've certainly done that, right? And feels like didn't take that long. I'm sure maybe it feels like it was longer than maybe you would have liked, but on some level, like you've realized your dreams and your ambitions. And I'm sure there's plenty of more things that you want to do and goals that you have and all of that. But when you reflect upon that, like, what do you think, like certainly talent, luck, like a lot of things have to coincide for this, this type of success, but do you think that you have a certain strength or quality that has allowed you to succeed? Like, what is it? What is your what is your superpower? I think I, you know I have a grind in me, um, and I like I I I, I wouldn't take uh, failure as you know I wouldn't accept failure, and and I think when I when I've met when I've come across like real real adversity i've i found the method in me i i used to have um i've told this story before but it's it's one of my most most important things that happened to me and, and sort of how what i grew out of it i used to have really punishing stage fright where i would throw up every time before i went on stage it's every hard, time. it's hard to believe that yeah um and um and then i would start getting panic attacks uh, on stage and and it was just it it was just an accumulation where and i was still in acting school when when this was happening and it was like i was i had these like voices in my head that were you know it was of course it was like insecurity and 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 it it was like i was faced with the with the reality that like maybe i'm not equipped to do this uh because it's clear like i'm 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 going up on stage and i'm not being able to do it because i'm because of what's happening yeah. inside my head wow. and so so i was i was about 3 years into acting school and i just had this horrendous breakdown in front of the whole school and an audience with people from the outside where I just so completely lost it and I couldn't recover. Um, 
and and I was just felt humiliated and um, and embarrassed, and I had this like long talk with myself where I was like, uh, I maybe this is m me telling myself that you know this is it. So, but then the idea of to quit was, you know, it was like to quit. It was, it felt like killing myself um, because I hadn't, you know, finding acting was the, it just gave me this whole purpose in life. It, 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 it I, I felt like it, my identity before acting was just like a little thug that was, you know, just a hustler kind of living a pretty ugly life where, you know, I would do a lot of different things to just get money and, you know, I mean, I was, I, I was like robbing people. Yeah. And, oh, wow. And, and like, the, uh, like the character in the killing a little bit, a little, <laughs> little, little bit of, uh, yeah, I was, I was, I was, I was, you know, and I really didn't have any moral compass. Uh, I mean, uh, selling shit and just not living a positive, like the, it was, it was like, I don't think that I would have ended up being a career criminal at all, but 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 it was just I was just living a, a, a negative life and with shitty people around, and then and then this acting thing just really like opened up something for me. It was like a possibility. It was like a window into a different life and feeling. And I understood later it it opened up a, a window of like feeling differently about myself. So when I was sort of confronted with this. It was so devastating, and uh, and and I, it, it was, and I couldn't accept it. But I didn't know what to do. Like I, like I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to do. Um, so then I, I in in the in that darkness, I sort of came up with this, like hail mary of an idea. I was like these fucking demons that are in my head, like these voices that like cripple me, that ruin everything. Like what is the worst thing that they could experience? Like what is the worst thing? And then, and then I figured out it would be to do like a monologue on stage where I'm like just just me, nothing, and I and I just uh, and I was like, okay, I'm I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna do. That. I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna challenge these. And and the next project that we had in school was we, we had our own projects, and it was mm -hmm. like a a three week deal where we got to do our own thing for three weeks. And most people took it as a sort of a break. They did like one scene together. Like four people did one scene. And I found this play uh, called Howie the Rookie. It was like this uh, play from Northern Ireland. And it's it written for two people where the first person is, is then featured in the second uh, storytellers. And I did both. And, and I ended up doing this play. I, I ended up creating 16 different characters uh, that all had like a different body and a different voice. And... And I started rehearsing this play like I was obsessed, like I was possessed. And uh, it was like an hour, it ended up being like about an hour and 40 minutes long. I knew it by heart after 10 days. Like mm. I was off because it was all I did. And um, and then and then we presented it for the school. And, uh, and I don't know, there was something I was like just overcome with, like I, I, was, I was so obsessed with, with, was kind of defeating this, like, I guess it was fear or I, I don't know what it was, but not accepting myself as a success or, or you know, I, I don't know what it, what it was, like what those voices actually are, that sort of insecurity. But I played it and uh, didn't trip on a word, like just uh, smashed it and, ended up doing five performances of that. And then it, that play got picked up by the National Theater. Hmm. So I actually ended up continued to playing it professionally. And after that, because that's actually like really high difficulty level, um, you know, because I had so many different characters and I was sort of playing it in, in the format of like, uh, I watched, I, I wanted to sort of make it feel like Richard Pryor you know, like the, a the, stand up one it was, man it was, show. Kind it was of thing. That, that sort of way of like talking. You know, where where, um, where the characters would talk with each other, and and uh, um, you know, and of course, I didn't have the pressure of needing to be funny, um, but it had funny elements in it. 
But after that, then the first job that I got after I finished acting school um, was, was to play Raskolnikov in Crime and Punishment. And, uh, and it, it was also the, the opening play of a new national theater with, with one of the best Swedish, maybe the best Swedish playwright that did a whole new re revamp of. And I was on the stage for three hours and 40 minutes doing Raskolnikov. And I think that would have been like really crippling uh, for me before this for sure. And but for anyone, it was like a lot of pressure for that to be your first job. But after I had done this, this monologue, it felt like nothing. Like mm -hmm. I had so much, <laughs> it felt like so right. much easier. And, and that sort of, that was the, the inflection point in my career. That's where everything changed. And I, and I found a way to like create real confidence by facing my fears and, uh, and like, and going, going at it head on. And, um, and it, it, that I found that solution in that darkness it changed everything for me. And it also became sort of a metric of how I dealt with dif difficult times ahead. To run um, towards them. Yeah, to face it and, and, to, uh, and to like challenge it. And it's like, okay, let's watch fucking this. Go. Yeah. Right, yeah. I mean, there's so much in what you just shared. I mean, this idea that you're this aimless person who is perhaps on a not so great trajectory, who's lacking self-esteem stumbles into this situation where you found something that is truly meaningful to you yeah. and then struggling to be able to kind of master your own vehicle to do it is almost like an existential crisis, right? Yeah. Like the stakes are very high for you because you're like, yeah. I finally found this thing and now I can't do it. Yeah, Like that's terrifying. Yeah. How do you resolve that? And to have the instinct to move towards it rather than away from it yeah. um, is almost like your own form of exposure therapy. Like the only mm. way I can like get over oh, yeah, this yeah. is to like destigmatize it by upping the ante and putting my forcing myself to be in that situation and walk through the fear to get to the other side. But to do that with a project of such a high degree of difficulty, like, yeah, that's a, that, it's almost like an instinctual thing that you came up with that probably wasn't even on some level conscious. No, it, it definitely wasn't conscious. It just, uh, yeah, I mean, it was kind of out of just desperation. Um, it, it lit, like, I don't have it in me to like kill myself, uh, um, but to sort of give up would be to it, it would be to kill the 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 potential of yeah. any life that I actually wanted to live. Um, so to sort of give up on that was so depressing. So I think that's the why I found the courage in a way to sort of. But then to, to have to that muscle it. memory around running towards something that scares you. I mean, the question that I asked you is like, what you know, if you have a superpower, what is it? You said you know how to grind, but beneath that, it's that instinct to go towards the scary thing yeah. that spills over into every aspect of your life. Like if you have that facility to not shy away from those things, then you're in this sort of curious growth mindset way of this approaching your life, right? a very good conversation. Yeah. <laughs> I, I actually haven't put the, I hadn't put those things together before, uh, yeah. Do you find yourself doing that in other areas of your life? I mean, you mentioned that you have a relationship coach. Like that's another, th like you have to seek out, like you have to be willing to go into an uncomfortable place if you wanna have greater intimacy in your relationships, if you wanna advance your career. Like every category, the solution is always moving towards the thing that you wish you didn't have to do. Yeah. And I think also like the great things in life uh, you get by putting in a lot of work. Like it's, it's so like the relationship that I have, you know, with the woman that I, it, it's, we don't have an easy relationship. Like we, not long ago, we were throwing smoothies at each other in public, uh -huh. you know? It was <laughs> <laughs> um, What's the, where's the, the, the differential? Like, what do you, wh where's the tension? Like, what's the, what's the issue that you, Run I mean, it's against. all her fault, you know. It's okay. all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Tell it to the relationship, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um 
No, we're both uh, pretty stubborn people, and uh, we both like to get it our way. And um, and you know, it's like sometimes it's like fire, fire meets fire. Yeah. And um, and we have a lot of passion and a lot of fun, um, but find it hard to compromise. And it's like we're going to figure it out and we're going to have like a great big life. Um, and, I, and I, but it, it's going to- You need a little outside intervention. Oh, to keep like it from going outside, off the rails. inside, it's yeah. like, yeah, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's Mark, it's MDMA, it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's all of those things. Uh -huh. So psychedelics is part of that protocol? Yeah, for sure. Wow, interesting. Your mom's a therapist though, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it's not like therapy is a foreign concept. No, but actually I haven't like, uh, I've been trying to find a, a good therapist for myself. Uh, I, I, um, I haven't done much therapy actually. Um, like I, I don't have like someone that I talk on, with on an individual level and I, I really need it. Um, but uh, it, I've, I've struggled finding someone. Um, but yeah, I, I think I grew up with my mom definitely always instilled a way of dealing with problems, of, you know, talking about problems, like trying to getting to the bottom of like what's really going on. Like why why did you, uh, you know, throw this thing at the teacher? And uh, uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, you were like a hyperactive kid who was getting in trouble. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was, I was, a, I think I was a bit of a nightmare. Uh huh. And how are things with dad? Uh, great now. Uh, uh, we definitely had our uh, vol volatile period, and uh, and also he was, you know, raised in a American way where, um, you know, he got his fair share of licks, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, a little bit of that translated into our relationship, and uh, so rocky during your your uh, turbulent adolescence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but but you know, it, it was, he he didn't know how to deal with me. He had a bad, he responded poorly. And, um, and he, you know, problems with his anger, controlling his anger. Um, and uh, yeah, so, but you know, we, we, we got, we got through it and, and, you know, when I was, I think in my early twenties, we had a, you know, this couple of really deep conversations where, you know, he apologized for some of the things that he had done, and mm -hmm. um, and we have we have a really beautiful and close relationship now. That's good. How do you stay grounded and and right sized with all the nonsense and bullshit that comes with the fame part of what you do? Yeah, it's uh, I I don't find it so hard, but um, you know, I for, for me, my my level of fame, it's a little different in Sweden. It can get a little intense still, even though it's not as intense as it was, you know, maybe five years ago. Um, for me, it's it's really important to have like really good people around you that that you have real friendships with. I mean, one big key is to not sort of play the fame game and just hang out with uh, people that you hang out with because mm -hmm. how they reflect on you. Do you uh, have like a solid group of friends here that aren't afraid to tell you what's what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you have to have that, but also, uh, like, I don't need that really. You know, I I know what's what, and. Um, I think that I, I I had a period of my life where I, I got lost in that. I, I I didn't realize it until a few years ago, but where I was really uh, concerned, I was thinking a lot about how I was perceived, and and I was really focused on how I was being perceived, and and I would even choose friends on how they would sort of reflect on me, and like you know I, I want to be you know this guy, you know the mm comes with a big crew and and uh, and then I think social media really doesn't help. Um, but it, actually this was like more before that, but um, but yeah, and, and then I, and I realized that, you know, like I, that, that, that is such a, 
that it, it's 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 such a hollow pursuit, you know, or that it, it's so it's so it's so shallow to to look at life and and people around you and 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 and, and like so I sort of kind of figured that out and and then I you know chose uh, stayed away from all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. I, I really haven't been chasing any uh, of of those sort of. I, I had I had there was a couple of years when I, I got a little bit lost in it and and. Uh, and I wanted to be seen with, you know, other famous people, and uh, you know, I wanted to be seen as someone that had a big crew that, you know, rolling deep, rolling entourage, deep. With yeah. the whole thing. Uh, well, exactly. I've noticed that you've you've stepped back from social media. I mean, you used to share videos and stuff like that, and I went to your Instagram, and there's just like one picture, and you're like, you're like, clearly, you're not participating in this anymore. Yeah. No, that was a, that was a great realization. Um, how bad it was for me um and um and it just put my mind in the wrong place for me uh social media just made me look at my life uh and made me feel like i wasn't doing enough that you know i should have all these other things i should be doing this i should be doing that uh, it just gave me a bunch of anxiety I, and i realized like i'm a pretty happy person and uh and i was just realizing that the, the anxiety that I was feeling, a lot of it was like coming from that. And then when I cut it out and when I removed all social media, um, man, it really changed me. Um, it Talk more about that. Yeah. It, um, first of all, it's like, it's so much noise. You just care and think about so much bullshit that's just it's like gossip it's basically gossip you're looking at other people's lives and and seeing you know the fake version that they're holding up to the world and uh so it's it's a bunch of noise but then it also like makes you feel shitty about yourself and and it makes me feel like man i should be doing this i should be doing that why don't i have this why don't i have friends like that oh you know all these like stupid thoughts that aren't based in reality and 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 have zero value but they're and this, these algorithms are just like kind of feeding on insecurity, and uh, and as soon as I cut it out, like it just like all faded away, and I and I, you know, I realized I wasn't missing out on anything. I mean, I miss out on some economic opportunities of you know endorsement deals and stuff like that, but it's okay. I I, I make money in other ways. Yeah, I mean, um, you're you're legit established like it's really not necessary for you i can imagine for somebody who's coming up like this is what you have to do and you have to be active here and this is how you you know unless you develop or cultivate some level of following it's more difficult to get cast or whatnot yeah you're kind of past that so you don't have to worry about that but on some level as an actor it doesn't serve you for the public to know so much about you, no. right? Like your job is to be subsumed into a character. And there's yeah. something about the mystique of like not knowing what this person's private life is all about that I think makes you more potent as a performer, but the incentives of our modern culture are all moving in the other direction. Yeah. But when we look at somebody like Quentin Tarantino or Daniel Day-Lewis, like we don't know anything about them. Like they're incredible artists who go away and disappear for however long and then return to treat us all to their gift and we celebrate them and it's all we think and talk about culturally for a moment because they're just in their art. You yeah. know, like they don't have to participate in this, whatever you wanna call it, like fucking bullshit influencer economy or whatever it is yeah. that's now sort of part of, it's sort of considered part of the job for somebody yeah. like you. So do you have pressure? Like, are there like, do you have team members who are like, you sure you want to do that? Like, <laughs> you know, no, actually not. Like, because my team is so old school, and uh, and it's also I think because acting is still pretty like shielded from it. So it's it's really, you know, of course there are a bunch of these sort of stars that have social media and you know they have businesses and all this is sort of intertwined and. And the you know, you know the the rocks and mm -hmm, the sure. Ryan Reynolds of the world that are also really good at it. They're good at. I mean that. I was that also just feels so bad like at their it. talent. Like, they, yeah. It feels natural for them to do yeah. it. You know, it doesn't feel forced. I mean, Ryan is the best. You know, because he's incredible. He, but he's also he's so he's so funny, and it's like, 
Um, and he, you could tell he's enjoying it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for, for me, I was just, uh, I sucked at it. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, it just, it just made me, it just made me a more nervous, insecure person in general. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's, um, uh, you know, if you if you if you figure it out, it's it's great. You know, like uh, uh, there's there's a, if if you enjoy it and 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 you're good at it, uh, you know, it's great. I'm, I think there's a lot of professional benefits to it. But for me, the 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 benefits of staying off way outweighed mm -hmm. the benefits mm -hmm. I was getting from from like trying to participate in that yeah. in that whole game. And um and then you know, even though I I sort of came up old school in the way that you know just what, like you were saying that you want to you want the audience to know as little about you as as possible for then it would be easier for them to suspend their disbelief yeah. when they see you in a in a character i don't know if that really matters that much um but um i just don't want to i don't want to play that game yeah <laughs> um I'm sure you get asked all the time by young actors, aspiring actors, uh, you know, for advice for a young artist that's at the inception of their career and they're staring down the barrel of all the obstacles and challenges that are inevitably gonna come in their direction. What is the advice that you give to somebody who has an artistic aspiration? Don't have a plan B. Um go all in there's no no other alternative if you, um, if you have a plan b as soon as it gets tough yeah that will weed out yeah. all the pretenders and you got and, and it's like uh and and that's the scary part you know but it it is a high risk high reward endeavor and and uh the competition's so high there's so many talented people that want it you know there is a great life at the other end of it uh with both artistic and monetary reward so you know, of course, it's a it's a really attractive uh, best case outcome. But um, if you want to get there, it's like just being talented is not going to be enough. Um, so you gotta you gotta become. I mean, that's I'm just speaking from what my, my experience and uh, uh, my experience is you have to become obsessed, um, and uh, and and you I think you have to have a singular focus. So, uh, so that means, you know, at least for a part of your life, being prepared to sacrifice everything else, and um, and just do that. I think that's the only way. But you know, if there if there's another way, that's great. But but that's that was sort of what worked for me. And when I've talked to other friends that uh, that also have kind of gotten through that sort of needle or th been able to thread that needle it's uh yeah patience yeah. persistence yeah and uh like i mean my goal was when i started out i didn't have like hollywood in mind at all for me success looked like being an actor that you know is on stage and sometimes gets to do like tv and film you know, in Sweden, that was like success. But I also saw that you have to be like top 10, top 15% of, of the most successful. Cause you know, I remember I, I would go to, you know, in my acting school, I, you know, the, the, the national theater school, we'd have these sort of parties and uh, on the weekends. And then, you know, these actors would come and hang out and you'd have these sort of actors in their, 40s 50s that were not successful and they would hang out at this, these school parties because they were hoping that some theater director was going to show up Oof. and they were, and 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 mm. they had this you know this desperate stench um and i saw that like that life um because it's such a it's a tricky profession where you're always like looking for the next gig you know there's you have to be comfortable with a lot of uncertainty yeah very 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 yeah. uncomfortable very comfortable with that but but it's also you're always like in pursuit you know of, a, of another gig so if you're not if people are not wanting to 
they're, if they're not asking you to dance, you know, you're going to be standing there on the dance floor. And, uh, and if you do that too long, um, that I think it rough. does something to you that's not good. You become insecure. And, and also because it's so paired with who you are, it's a diff difficult uh, profession to be um, unsuccessful in. That also becomes repellent to other people. So it's a cycle, right? Yeah. Because the more desperate you are, the less people, people can read that energy and, yeah. and they're, they, it moves them in a direction opposite to where you are. Yeah. So I actually, even though I had this like this sort of enormous, uh, I f you know, I felt this gratitude and, and I found this, you know, this passion for this and, and, and it, it created a positive identity for myself for the first time. I also saw this and, and I actually vowed to myself that if like, if I'm not in the top 10% of my generation after three years, I'm going to quit and I'm going to do something else. Uh, and and I, th that's something I told myself. I don't know if I would have. Yeah, I was wondering, like if, if that had occurred, do you think you would have done that? Because I don't know. the other piece here that I think is really important is that lights on moment where you locked in and you had that um, flow state experience and yeah. the lights went on and you realized like this was something that you could fall in love with. Like yeah. that's not about a career. It's not about, you know, paychecks or anything like that. That's yeah. about like something inside of you that needed to be nourished. And yeah. I think that, that is that speaks to like the authenticity of the journey that that you went on. Like, what does this mean? What is the why behind it? Yeah. I think because the why is the only thing that's going to sustain you, especially if you don't have a plan B. That's true. Yeah, I think maybe that was a maybe that was something that I was telling myself, you know, to push myself. Um, um, because it is it is a tricky thing that it, you know, but but it, but it is also what, what I. To, to to really like when 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 people ask you know me um, like how how to do it and how to um, I, you know like like how do you, how do I get famous and how do I you know and, and I'm like if you start in that end of, you, of fame then, done. then then you're, and then you're done you have to fall in love with the craft and and you have to become obsessed with the craft and and continue to hone that and then like the success will come. Um, and I think, I, I, th I think that's it too, but, but, but it is a, it is a tricky profession to, to, uh, to get stuck in, you know, if you don't, but, but, but I think the, the, the only, the only way is to go all out and to, and to just, mm -hmm. uh, and, and be relentless. The crazy thing about it is that it's one of the only career paths where your entire life could change overnight. Like yeah. audition, 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 and then, you know, pilot or whatever it is and like everything changes. So it's almost like this weird slot machine. I know. Not it's that a... it's all about luck. Like obviously there's preparation and talent and there's a lot that goes into it. But I think that that um, sensibility that as dark as it is or as hard as it is that it could literally change tomorrow because you got a call back. Yeah can keep people in it maybe longer than they should. I don't know, like, yeah. but I, I would imagine that you can create an unhealthy relationship with that fantasy of what a life could be um, that detracts from the craft piece of it. Yeah. But the thing is that when I look at like fellow actors and, and people that I've known over the years, The people, it's very rare where you see someone that is really talented and also works really hard that doesn't eventually, you know, get their due. That's it, good it, to hear. It's because um, I would have thought maybe it's not quite the case. Like it's not a meritocracy. Like I'm sure you know lots of super talented performers who, you know, don't get the break or the breaks don't come as easily as perhaps fairness would say they should. I feel like a, a lot of the time, it, you know, and then of course success can look in different ways, but 
the hard thing is to kind of stay strong and to and to nourish your confidence um while being rejected when you're sort of in this audition game yeah um and I, I think you have to find other ways to 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 practice your craft to, to like just do a play and um to get on stage and, and you know put something together yourself where where you're actually practicing your craft and 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 where you're where you can showcase it and and not just you know do these you know 100 auditions right right are you gonna get back on the stage man i've been saying that for so long <laughs> and it's uh i was i've been actively looking and yeah. i'm trying but it's uh what's next what do you got coming up well who knows it's uh this whole this fall has been very frustrating with strikes and projects moving it, it kind of the whole business got shook up so i've had a couple of projects push and fall apart and uh, i'm supposed to go shoot something i was supposed to go shoot something in in january i think now it's pushing to march and and yeah i i, I had my whole year booked up my whole my whole year was kind of set and then things fell apart and then i had it set again and so uh, i'm i'm not 100 percent sure yeah uh, the things that I have lined up are half of them are sort of independent and and they're you know more vulnerable to change. Yeah. Well, I'm a fan, dude. I appreciate you coming to talk to me today. Um, it's cool to get a glimpse into your life. Thanks, man. Yeah. I, I really enjoyed this conversation. Uh, this, is the, this is the longest. Uh, is it? We yeah, can keep I, going. I got. We can go for hours more <laughs> if you want. No, but it's um, uh, like I love I love podcasts and I love listening to to podcasts. So it, it's a. Uh, it's really valuable to to have these like long form conversations. Yeah, cool, and, man. And I, I like, I, I got some insights into into myself here. <laughs> this uh, this was like glad a, to give you something. I, to did take I find my you. therapist? Yeah. Like, <laughs> I, I'll serve that role for you. Um, and uh, yeah, come back when you have something more to talk about. I'd man. love to. I really man. enjoyed. Uh, yeah, I really enjoyed I, talking to you. I appreciate so it. So did I. Yeah. So everybody, check out Silent Night. I think it's coming out on on. Uh, on VOD, like December. It's 19th. playing in theaters. It's so, in theaters so go now. Check it in yeah, theaters. this isn't going up right away. I think, um, but it will be. It will be available for streaming. Okay, yeah, soon too. I think. I think on the nineteenth of December, yeah. it's available on VOD. And uh, for all mankind, for dude. all mankind, even, streaming. There's so many things I wanted to talk to you about. We didn't even get to go deep into all of that. So yeah, I'd love to have you back, man. Yeah, yeah. If, you'll, if you'll come back, I'll Thanks. be back. All right, for sure. Peace, dude. Bro. Peace. Cheers. That's it for today. Thank you for listening. I truly hope you enjoyed the conversation. To learn more about today's guest, including links and resources related to everything discussed today, visit the episode page at richroll.com where you can find the entire podcast archive, as well as podcast merch, my books, Finding Ultra, Voice of Change and the Plant Power Way, as well as the Plant Power Meal Planner at meals.richroll.com. If you'd like to support the podcast, the easiest and most impactful thing you can do is to subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, and on YouTube, and leave a review and or comment. Supporting the sponsors who support the show is also important and appreciated, and sharing the show or your favorite episode with friends or on social media is, of course, awesome and very helpful. And finally, for podcast updates, special offers on books, the meal planner, and other subjects, please subscribe to our newsletter, which you can find on the footer of any page at richroll.com. Today's show was produced and engineered by Jason Camiolo with additional audio engineering by Kale Curtis. The video edition of the podcast was created by Blake Curtis with assistance by our creative director, Dan Drake. Portraits by Davey Greenberg Graphic and social media assets, courtesy of Daniel Solis. Thank you, Georgia Whaley, for copywriting and website management. And of course, our theme music was created by Tyler Pyatt, Trapper Pyatt, and Harry Mathis. Appreciate the love. Love the support. See you back here soon. Peace. Plants. Plants.